Screening on Tuesday as part of the Unknown Pleasures series of films um, highlighting Australian cinema is a film called Queensland, uh, a 1975 film which went on to win the AFI Award for Best Short Fiction. And it's my great pleasure to be speaking to John Ruane, who is the director and co-writer with Ellery Ryan of Queensland, and Chris Luskery, who is the co-curator with Bill Masoulis of Unknown Pleasures. Welcome all to Movie Metropolis. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Good to see you all. And and John, I'll ask you first of all. Uh, such a, a, an interesting film. It was great to uh, to see it again. I'd seen it many many years ago, and it's now restored. Tell me about the inspiration behind making Queensland. Well, uh, I thought about about that last night in um, nineteen seventy. Two, I started a documentary on homeless men mm. uh, with another chap at La Trobe Uni, and um, we never finished it. But we used to go to the Gill, uh, which was the Salvation Army man's home in the city, and another uh, St. Vincent's home, and talk to people there. And then I went to film school. Then we saw the Donald Shabib film going down the road mm. about people that moved from rural Canada to um, Ontario or whatever. And then there was the, the the important film, John Houston's Fat City. Then there was an article, weirdly an article, about a slaughterman who'd killed his de facto wife and slept with her for three days. I don't know why. Then that sort of sparked putting the whole three things together. Uh, I don't know how it all went together, but I know they were the, 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 the points, yeah. Hmm. How, how very interesting. And it, it also is very much um, a working class film set in, in, in Melbourne, um, which was sort of the antithesis of what was happening with the film industry uh, in terms of the big budget productions that were uh, being made, Picnic and Hang Rock and all that sort of thing at that time. So uh, I, I gather um, making the film, budgeting for it, etc., was not necessarily an easy task. Well, you've got to remember, it was a student film. Ah. I mean, I had, no, I had no expectations of it being screened apart from the final year mm. uh, to, to the lecturers. So, but we had applied for money from the Experimental Film Fund. Um, I think we got uh, 10 grand and then we, I put in a grand and Chris Fidget put in a grand. So we had $12,000. We couldn't pay the actors. Uh, then the, uh, unfortunately, Swinburne, the film school said, once you made a film, you couldn't make a film over 20 minutes, so you, we couldn't use their gear, which made it even more difficult. So we ended up buying a second-hand camera in Nagra, uh, and they allowed us to have a couple of lights, and uh, that's how the film got made. Wow. How interesting. Yeah. So, Chris, tell me about choosing the film, and uh, especially now that it's been restored. Yeah, well, I mean, it was a pretty easy choice. I've 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 known John for quite a while, and also John Flaus is a regular at, um, attendee of our, a lot of our screenings, which is amazing because he always uh, contributes uh, very very um, profound and insightful comments on the films that we're screening during the Q and A's. So, um, to me, uh, Queensland is is very obviously and overtly one of the most significant Australian films of the mid seventies. Um, it speaks to a particular working class life, working class milieu, a certain sense of naturalism, a certain sense of a kind of a, a Australian battle of spirit that I think is very organically and beautifully developed in the film. And it's not something, I mean, obviously John's picked picked up on that in, in future works. Um, and one could say that that's, that's a large part of what he's exploring in films like Death in Brunswick, et cetera. But um, for me, it's like it's really unadulterated and very pure in Queensland, and there aren't too many Australian films, sort of post that period, that have. Well, there's many Australian films that have that have tried to do that, but there's few that have done it in a way that's that's quite as um for me quite as affecting as, as Queensland. Okay. Can I ask you, oh uh, Chris, Love Letters from Trelbar Road was that made before or after? I can't remember. It was one year later. It was one, one year. year later. Yeah, seventy six. Yeah, so yeah, those those two films pair really beautifully, obviously. But um, yeah, I think there's and you know, um, apart from sort of uh, explorations in documentary that were sort of um, coming out around the same time, 
most of the films that have that have tended to kind of that have grown in the wake of a film like Queensland, say in the eighties and especially in the nineties, that have approached the working class spirit don't have that level of um, realism or naturalism. Um, Queensland feels almost like a documentary, even though it's it's a scripted drama. And I think maybe John, that's testament to the ways in which the real life uh, encounters that you made while you were developing the film really informed that. You know, I was thinking too. I had an uncle who was kind of banished from the family. He yeah. used to turn up at our house drunk over in Pascoval. And I always wondered, where did he spend his days and nights? Hmm. I remember when my father always used to ring the police and get the police to take him away. Jeez. Anyway. Wow. <laughs> but, yeah. John, oh, John, and the other thing I've, I've thought... In, yeah. Uh, no, go on, John. Uh, oh, you... I was going to say some of... It was like... Part of an inspiration was some of the oh. what's happening there, Peter. Uh, not sure. Anyway, oh, keep going. I'm still speaking. Okay, yeah. was uh, uh, was seeing some of the Seventeenth Doll. It was a bit like that in reverse. Ah, the Ray Lawler play. Yep. Know it well. <laughs> so, John, I wanted to ask you, working with Ellery Ryan to uh, to script the film, and of course having John Flaus. Uh, so important to have him in the film. How much of it was uh, was written as a solid script, and how much was there improvisation in the film itself? I would say there was virtually no improvisation. It was all scripted. Ah. Uh, and um, yeah, the film would not have happened if it wasn't for John. Not that mm. I ever thought of him as an actor, but when we went to the Experimental Film Fund, the three assessors were John. Brian Robson, who was head of the film school, had already told me I couldn't make the film, and he was now on the committee. And I think Ross Dimsey, if it wasn't um, John convincing it, the film would not have happened because Brian certainly didn't want it to happen. And when I finished the film, he called me into the office, his office at the end of the year, and told me I'd failed the course. And I said, how could I fail the course? I've just made this 50-minute film. He said, yeah, but you haven't mixed it yet, so technically you haven't finished the film. Mm. <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> and it was after. That was, do you think that was jealousy, John? Do you think that was like you uh, yeah, know? He was, everyone talks about crazy. making features, but few people actually do um, in the in that system. So, and you went out and did it really before anybody else really in the Australian film school system made a feature. So, well, yeah, I mean, I think it was vengeance. Like you know, he was upset that the film got made, mm. and then uh, I said. Uh, Anyway, I won't say what I said, but um, I got a pass. I got 50, which, I mean, I didn't know if I needed it or not. But, um, yeah, but John, John, then after we came out of the meeting, when he told us he had the money, we had the money, said he suggested himself to play Doug. Because mm. I'd never, ever thought of him playing Doug. Never. Mm. Uh, I had no idea who was going to play Doug. But then um, we thought about it. I said, you, I don't know, I think he had a beard then. I said he'd have to shave his beard off. Um, but then when he came in to rehearse, he kind of was Doug. Mm. And then we um, we went to a guy called Harold Bajant. I talked to him on the phone. He was the voice of Mad Max in Mad Max 2, Thunder, um, the second Mad Max, you know, that, that in, introduces the film at the very beginning. Yep. I talked to him and he suggested a few other actors and they came along to the hall opposite Swinburne and that's where we had some kind of rough, audition yeah mm. okay well tell me about casting uh bob carl and alison bird who uh i'm not so familiar with no well um again harold bajant suggested them and they turned up and i know that um bob who i'd never seen before he was uh, a little bit pissed off when i started to direct him in the um the rehearsals but i kind of um got him to change it a little bit. And I think he, when he was working with John, he saw that that was working. And so then he thought he'd listen to me. Alison Bird again was suggested by Harold and she was the only person we saw. And then my father who ran a panel beating shop, one of the assessors who used to come in and assess the cars uh, used to be an extra in commercials. My father was saying to him, oh, John's making this film. And he said, oh, I can get all these extras if he wants these extras. And they've all, always wanted to act. So I got a lot of extras who for the first time got more than 
one line of dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, so that's how the film was put together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How interesting to hear that. And tell me about the use of locations because it is that very naturalistic uh, sort of settings that you use um, and also that uh, wonderful car that's in the film. <laughs> the old Holden. Yes. Yeah, well, that, that the film is virtually all shot around um, Collingwood uh, mm. and um, Northcote and um, the car, I have, well... I don't know where the car from came from. Whoever was at the Brux manager brought the car along. And, um, we, I mean, it was always in the script that poor old Bob had to suck the petrol out and then try and get the motor to work. And the last shot was I was trying to, we were trying to do a copy of um, Arthur Penn's film, Mickey One, the mm. ending of that film, where Warren Oates, uh, not Warren Oates, was it Warren Beatty, yep. walks down the street at night and the camera goes up. So when Ellery and I went out to check locations and we went up to that uh, high street past the old, past the Palace Cinemas now, and you look down on that street, it was perfect. Uh, so we we got the council, rang the city council, again, the production manager, I think it was Adrian Pickerskill, went on to be a production manager, um, went down to the city council at Northcote and they brought the water truck out to wet the street down for a slab of beer, which is pretty kind of them. Amazing. Uh, and... I mean, I work with Ari because he shot the film and also we co-wrote it. Mm. Um, but we, we wrote it in the uh, in 1974 and then got the funding uh, in early 75. So I was uh, I was 22 when I made it and Ari was wow. six, he was 28, so he was much more mature than I was. Yeah. And when, do you, when, what was the first the response to the first screening like? Hmm. Well, I can't. Uh, well, in those days, uh, Swinburne Film School didn't screen the student films. So you mm. finished a film and that was it. You know, you went on your way. So uh, I hired the State Film Centre and put on two other student films and showed Queensland to, I suppose, a selected group of friends, parents, and other students. That, and it seemed to go down pretty well. But then it wasn't really, then I think it was screened at the co op a year or so later for a couple of weeks. And then it was screened at the um, St Kilda Film Festival or the mm. Melbourne Film Festival and I think it's screened at the London Film Festival and then I, God knows how Greg Lynch who was uh, a distributor sold it to the ABC which was a miracle for $25,000 so we actually, we actually paid the actors in the end uh, 10 years later we paid everybody what they're supposed to be paid including the crew I think it's probably an only short film that actually got its money back and went into profit. So mm. cool. Um, and then when it was screened, uh, there was a huge, uh, AB, I don't know, whoever bought it at the ABC must have been fired immediately the next day because they screened it at 10 o'clock at night unannounced. And then there was all these letters from people who lived in Queensland who thought it was going to be a travel log, <laughs> uh, who were extremely disappointed that the car never got out the end of the street at North. <laughs> Uh, and it's never been never been screened again by the ABC. So I don't know what Greg had over someone, where he caught somebody doing something and blackmailed them into buying the film. Um, and then it sort of went into uh, abeyance. It disappeared. Then suddenly in the last year, there's been a couple of screenings of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, tell me about then the film being nominated and winning the Best Short Fiction Award at the uh, Australian Film Institute Awards, because that was certainly a, a great kudos to you uh, in terms of a student film getting that recognition. Well, there's always a slap in the beat. They give with one hand, they take with the other. Because <laughs> I remember when it won, uh, somebody, one of the judges said to me, you didn't win the silver medal or the gold medal. We gave you the bronze award which was like you won, but it was like a third-class win. Mm. And <laughs> that was a, like, right. And then there was another award. I remember it used to be the Greater Union Awards for short films. Oh, yeah. Mm. And it didn't win that. Gillian Armstrong's film, The Singer and a Dancer, um, won that film, which was a very, you know, they had a professional crew uh, and quite a big budget, had about $35,000, $40,000 budget. Um, but... I mean, it was it was a testament, I suppose, to the film itself. That even though it was a student film, and nobody and everybody on the crew was doing something for the first time, mm. the film was still um, 
it still got its message across. Yeah, it, it certainly did. Oh. So, so, John, tell me about the restoration process because I, I haven't seen the actual restored version. I've seen the uh, original version. Um, but tell me about that. Well, uh, Ray Argel uh, mm. decided to uh, – another short film I've worked on, Feathers and Queensland, I think he's done quite a few films, decided to go back to the original AMB roles and actually make a proper copy. I mean, the only copy I've ever had is an old VHS copy. Mm. So it was quite a shock to see it, although because it was, it was shot in a clear NPR with an old Angino zoom lens, which were always quite soft, and if you didn't have an, enough light, they were really soft. And, I mean, whenever I watch the film, all I see is pain where there's so many shots that are still slightly out of focus because of that lens. And, I mean, we're making the film with three redheads or something, so when you mm. go to – and with no extras um, – but the film, I, I was surprised how well about 80% of the film came up. It was a, bit, a vast improvement from seeing it on a VHS. Um, but I had nothing to do with the restoration. Elry talked to Ray a bit about some of the um, color grading. But um, I've only seen, I've seen it once since it's been restored. And it was on such a big screen. It was, I think I was in shock. So it'd be better to see it, for me to see it on a slightly smaller screen. <laughs> <laughs> it looks it looks absolutely gorgeous and and ray's really doing um he's he's quite the unsung hero ray argo like he's doing some really terrific work and we screened a restoration that he did of uh margot nash's vacant possession peter that you may recall because you yes. interviewed us me and margot about it um and that was a beautiful restoration made from a from a uh, an interpositive not from negative but beautifully textual and um, very wonderfully sort of uh, restored colour. And I think in, in this instance, um, the film just looks glorious, like the the, the colours. And there there is, I, I mean, I was previewing it again the other day, that there is like um, quite a beautiful grain structure and sharpness to um, the vast majority of the film. So it's it's I think it's probably the best that it's ever looked, John. Yeah, I don't think it's ever going to look any better than that. Yeah. Uh, like it, uh, you know, go out and shoot something again, make it in focus. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So uh, I, 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 you're gone. Keep going. I remember I was uh, when we finished uh, at Swinburne. Uh, I went to work at Myers Camera Department, and uh, I was working there. And I said to the boss, "I said, I, I actually um, can I have three hours off? I want to go and mix my film. I have to go to uh, Victorian Film Labs." And he said, "Are you working here at Myers Camera Department, or are you making a film?" And I said, well, I, I both. And he said, okay, I'll give you two and a half hours and you can come back and do the night shift here until nine o'clock. And then in those days when you mixed, remember, they didn't have rock and roll or whatever it is. Remember, you had to mix the film in one go. Mm. You couldn't stop and go, oh, Wally, can we go through that again because that's no good. He just, We just did a run through the film. And I remember Wally Shaw, it was like smoking all the time, looking at the Sporting Globe. His arm hit one of the faders up when they're putting the petrol in the car and you'll hear the birds go. They start to get louder and louder. And I kept telling him, Wally, Wally, bring it down. But there was, there was one go of mixing the film. That was it. One go. Then I had to be back at Myers. So, so you, hang on, you mixed the entire film in two and a half hours and you've never, you, there was no oh, remix. That two and a half hours included me travelling from the city to VFL and oh back in. So I had half an hour with Wally at the beginning to set a couple of levels and then there was one go of the film. We just went right through the film. That was it. I left and that was the film done. Wow. We, wow. What a process that was. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> So, I suppose you'd look jealously now at the digital technology that we have and how things are, are so much better, I suppose, in many respects. Well, that's right. See, I, I've never made a film digitally. Mm. I mean, my career finished years ago, but everything was always shot on film. So it was only during the end did I get a monitor. So mm. it was always that magic process of you never saw what you shot until you saw rushes. Mm. which was such a great thing for a bonding situation with the cast and crew because, you know, you'd see what – you didn't see it till the end of the day. So the film was always – there was something magical about it because you didn't possess it till 
hours later. You'd shot mm. it, but it was still invisible to see. Mm. So it was a magical process, not like now. Mm. Well, it sounds like an old pensioner talking about the 20th century. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, I mean, uh, sorry, Peter, go ahead. No, no, Chris, you, you, you keep going. Oh, I, I was going to mention um, the way that, well, I mean, the film's also Flaus's first major acting role. So that's like one of the sort of most notable things about the film is is that. And and Flaus gives a pretty amazing performance for someone who's who's basically doing their, first, their debut feature film role. So I, I think it's probably worth talking about Flaus for a bit because he's also going to yeah. be present at the screening on, on Tuesday. Well, you know, I think his performance... Uh, we had a few days where we just went through each scene uh, and rehearsed it, and really that was when his performance was set. Mm -hmm. When we went out to make the film, we're all students. Everyone else is trying to make their films at the same time. So mm -hmm. I'd have half a day here, and then we wouldn't do something again for a few days later until I could get the people together. So mm -hmm. really the onus on, of performance, and in, in a way – even direction was set during the rehearsals and the onus of John to, to come up with the performance was really in a, in a way within himself. Mm. I was there to try to get through the, the, through the two hours. Uh, what time was the train going to come the next train that was going to come over the, um, the crossing. Mm. Um, so I have to give a lot of the credit to the actors themselves. Yeah. Okay. But it, he never, he never forgot his lines, or he never um, had a temper tantrum, or he never, he never said, "I don't want." I don't think we ever changed. I'm honestly don't think we changed any lines of dialogue that were in the script. Wow. Well. But but it is such a natural performance, and he's so good in in those sorts of roles, and uh, especially that dreaming of Queensland and wanting to escape, etc. Uh, it uh, it he really does a, an excellent job, and he he continues to do that uh, in so many other performances that he's in. That's right. You know, it's strange seeing, in a way, some two bookends, Queensland, and that film Frank. Is it um, the last film we did with Penny? What's it called? Uh, where he's the old guy and there's the lady who lives next door to him. Is it Frank and I? Or... Oh. Oh. Um... Uh, yes, I'm trying to think. <laughs> it's a kind of like that was Doug that he's grown up in, in later years. That I, I felt there were two bookends, those two yeah. films. Yeah. And then we, we used him again as the farmer in Feathers. Trust Frank, I think it's called. What's it called? Trust Frank. Trust Frank. That's a, yeah, short film. Yeah. That's a oh, beautiful film. Okay, yeah, don't think I know it. Okay, so now, John, tell me about how influential was um, Queensland in terms of making Feathers, of course, which also won uh, AFI Award, and, of course, you went on to make uh, uh, Death in Brunswick, uh, Dead Letter Office, so, so, so interesting films. But was Queensland pretty much your calling card or did you really have to scramble to make other films? Well, that was made in 1975. When I finished it, I thought, oh, right, I've done this 50-minute film. I'll get a job at Crawford's. Well, I wrote mm. to Crawford's. I ran Crawford's. I couldn't get an interview. I wrote to the ABC, said, can I show you my 50-minute film and get a job as a trainee director down there? And they said, no, we, you know, we don't need to see it. We've got our own people. So mm. I did not make another drama for 10 years. Mm. Uh, and that was uh, really because... I was working at Rusden uh, as a tutor, come Storm and Packer, and one of the people, Marsha Bennett, said, hey, John, there's an ad in the age here for unemployed people to train as a film crew, which I can not believe that. They put up money. So that was the so-called Australian Film Theatre that made three plays in the films. So I took Queensland along as my rehearsal piece, and I got a job doing one of the things hanging together uh, who was written by Gordon Graham who wrote The Boys later and years later. So mm. I directed that. And that led me to um, directing Feathers because although it was never screened anywhere, it was a black comedy. Mm. But um, Feathers, uh, Queensland's kind of, yeah, I mean, it was, I think on average it took people who left Swinburne 10 years to make a mark after they left Swinburne. Mm. 
But I suppose that's you're... added now. Uh, some people have more accelerated careers, but it does feel like there's about, at least in the in the long form space, space the feature space, that it, it tends to be about an eight to ten year lag. I think. Yeah. Yes. There are a few people who make a short film now. They get to make a feature straight away, but mm. it didn't happen then. But I must say, your most emblematic film, the one that's really um, uh, I'm most excited about, is Death in Brunswick. That was such a great film, and uh, you must have had challenges making that one. Well, you know what uh, the AFC uh, after feathers, right? So I was I was, I was anointed, um, and uh, Death in Brunswick went. The AFC gave money for it to be developed, mm. and it was a one of the first kind of uh, you went on like a, a script camp thing it was in Dalesford. I was very lucky to get two people to read the script. One was Alan Plater, who um, was an English writer, he's gone now. Uh, he had written a very British coup. Ah. He was on. Uh, he gave me notes on the script, and also Frank uh, Frank Frank Pearson, who wrote Dog Day Afternoon and ah. Cool Hand Luke. He also read the script and gave gave us notes on it, so they were very encouraging. And then, unfortunately, uh, Sir David Putman, where we you paid five hundred dollars to have a uh, half hour audience with him. So Tim, mm. who was the producer. He said, this is one of the worst scripts, and I don't want to see this made. It's a waste of time. He said, I made a very similar film to this years ago with Mick Jagger in it, and uh, I don't think this works anywhere near it. I don't know how he got those two things confused. So then after that, um, the head of the AFC said that they were not going to fund the film and that uh, I had, I if I kept on with this, I'd uh, end whatever kind of hopes I had at having a career. So when the, we waited then for the next person at the AFC to take over, they didn't even be funded because they said it was too commercial. Um, it was only funded. The only reason why it happened was that Tim had a, ended up being best man, actually, uh, at somebody's wedding who was working for a company called the Overseas Film Group mm. who put up money. Uh, uh, they actually didn't, they didn't put, they put up a production guarantee, but Tim and Bryce had to mortgage their houses to fund that. And then when Sam Neill came on board, they put up 200000 for his wage. Uh, but it was still touch and go whether the film would get off the ground. Mm -hmm. What was the clincher in the end? I don't know. It, it, who knows? It went through, was it uh, the early stages of the FFC? I think uh, obviously the overseas film group backing it. But then when the film was finished, and I met the guy who ran the company. He said, we're really disappointed in this film. We thought we were getting Porky's 3. And I said, Porky's 3? How, how did you figure that? So he said, we're not sure how we're going to handle the film, what we're going to do with it. Um, so, you know, that was a bit of a disappointment. The film, then when the film launched in England, the IRA had a slight bombing campaign in the cinema or near there. Uh, yeah, yeah, interesting, yeah which uh, kind of slowed the momentous of anyone going to the cinema. And then it was released commercially in Germany, and they said we can't call it Death in Brunswick because Brunswick's the most boring city in all of Germany. <laughs> we have to call it, so they called it a company for Mrs. DeMarco. Um, and the film really, in Australia, the film made money in the southern states. It didn't kind of work in Sydney or Brisbane. Mm. Maybe because it had the suburb of Melbourne, of the Victorian of Melbourne in, in the title. It'd be interesting mm -hmm. that that was Oswald Denny business in, in Sydney. Wow. Okay, my Zoom is rapidly running out, so we we, oh. <laughs> uh, we can talk like this for a long time about some of your other films as well, but let's stick to Queensland. Now, it's on Tuesday night uh, at the Thornbury Picture House as part of the Unknown Pleasures series of films. You'll be there, John will be there, and uh, there'll be a discussion about the film. Okay. Yeah, so Jake Wilson's going to be moderating the Q and A, um, and yeah, John Ryan and John Flaus will both both be present, and um, yeah, it should be a very very lively evening, I think. It um, should if, be. If John, if John Flaus is on form, uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it is. We could be going for quite a while. 
<laughs> oh, what a terrific uh, series of films uh, that you're screening, uh, Chris and uh, and Bill Masoulis, the uh, Unknown Pleasures series. And uh, John, congratulations again on uh, Queensland and on your other films. And uh, who knows, maybe you'll make another film one day. That's right. I'll get a new battery for the pacemaker. Ah. <laughs> 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 okay, uh, we've been speaking to John Ruane and Chris oh, Lustre. Pleasure. Pleasure. Great to talk to you both. Thanks so much. Okay. Bye. <laughs> okay, see you later. Bye bye. <laughs>